SB 534. And uh, this is, I think it's going to change West Virginia tourism-wise as dramatically as any other bill that's been passed for tourism, Charlie. It's going to free up places to do things that we take for granted when we visit other cities. Uh, and it's bringing West Virginia along into the year 2023. So this is a good idea, I think a great idea, a great law. Has the governor signed it into law yet? Uh, the last time I checked, he had not, but that was a couple of days ago. So he may have since then, Rob. I, don't, I just don't know. Okay, let's talk about the different aspects of Senate Bill 534. Can you tell me everything that was kind of combined into making this bill? I think, Mike Hornby, you had some input well, here. I tell you, um, when I first read this, this bill was 90-odd pages. And, and the further you get into it, the more you giggle to yourself as a West Virginian. And it, it it just got better and better as you go through it, and maybe Charlie can highlight. I know you, you wrote it, Charlie. Um, but how did it start, and, and how did it grow into the behemoth that it was? Well, uh, first of all, it would be uh, inaccurate to say that I wrote it. It was uh, certainly a team effort. There were lots of there were lots of hands uh, stirring, stirring that kettle, including uh, our colleague Jason Barrett. You know who was uh, highly involved in the Senate working on on that. Uh, I, I'll start out by saying that you know our our laws regarding alcohol in West Virginia have been uh, for a long time very antiquated, and uh, you look around outside West Virginia and you see the enormous economic impact that things like the you know the Virginia vineyards. Uh, and wineries have produced, and, and we've got interest in West Virginia. People that want to do those things use it to develop tourism. We've seen uh, a pretty pretty strong growth as a result of legislation we've done over the last few years of craft brewers here in West Virginia. That's a, that's a big sector. Um, distilleries uh, and and some some wineries and. Uh, you know, the antiquated nature of our laws has been holding West Virginia back. So this this year is no different than many other past years. We uh, took another whack at trying to knock down some of the barriers that um, uh, would prevent reasonable, uh, we're not talking about hope, about turning all of West Virginia into Bourbon Street in New Orleans, but at least creating the opportunities for people to enjoy uh, the, you know, the magnificent growing tourism possibilities we have here in the Mountain State. So hit some of the highlights of this bill, Charlie, as to what it will allow, what it will change. Well, it, first of all, it gives control. It gives some control to municipalities and says that they, it, it authorizes them to create designated outdoor areas where people can have uh, in a, in a, not a glass, but a, a plastic or a metal cup, uh, they can walk outside of the, you know, the private club or place where it was poured and served and have it in, and enjoy it in areas that are outside that are designated, uh, by the municipalities. And it creates, uh, some possibilities for that. It puts, it puts authorization for it in the hands and control of cities and towns and gives them the responsibility to make sure that it's, you know, run correctly, that it doesn't become a, uh, you know, a place uh, where uh, unwholesome activity is occurring. Uh, that that was a very big thing that's part of that bill. And I, I think there will probably be some towns and cities across West Virginia that uh, want to try to do that and enhance their outdoor tourism. Mike Hornby. Yeah, so um... – I, I agree with Charlie 100 percent with that. And I think uh, the other aspect of, of this bill is that the fairs and festivals can can utilize this bill to to serve or um, give samples. So so a a brewer or a distiller could come to a fair and festival and serve their product or promote their product, which I thought was was great. What Charlie? What was the uh, the part of the bill that was for brewers having a second? Um, Location, location, a manufacturing location where they could actually brew, and I couldn't believe this was actually a law that they couldn't do it already. But what was the the, the impetus of that 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 side of it? There are a couple uh, brewers, couple craft brewers in the state 
uh, which contacted us and other members of the Senate, perhaps the House too, Mike, I don't know, uh, you know, who are growing their little businesses and being successful and said, look, we, we would like to have, we think we can open a second location. Uh, and these are places that serve food, often high-quality food, uh, all really important stuff for the tourism business in West Virginia, and sought to do so and found out, oh, guess what? You know, the law right now says, nope, just one. Uh, this is what we're uh, sort of dealing with every year almost when we have these bills uh, because people find out they can't do what um, their uh, similar businesses in other states are able to do. They apply to the ABC to do something and find out, no, it's not permitted uh, under West Virginia's laws, which are, as I said, antiquated. So uh, that was another barrier that we tried to knock down to help develop uh, that business and, and uh, opportunity for economic growth in West Virginia. Mike Height. Good morning, Charlie. Mike, good morning. So, good morning. So let me ask you this. What was what spurred on this piece of legislation? You said earlier that you had some people come to you uh, about one aspect of it. Is that what uh, spurred all the different aspects of it? Did you have different uh, groups of people or individuals coming to you and saying, well, hey, we need this for, for expansion and growth? Yeah, it's a great question, uh, and we get that every year. Every year there are people, you know, two or three years ago, uh, I'll give you a perfect example uh, here in our eastern panhandle, um, and this is several years ago. Uh, the Austin family came to us. The, the, they wanted to start uh, a brewery, a brew pub, craft brewing there at the Bavarian Inn, and they were prohibited by the, our law from doing it. So we set to work. This is... I don't know, four, perhaps four or five years ago, on changing the law so that they could do that at the Bavarian. And others have done it since, but it's turned out to be wonderful. It's just fabulous what they've done over there. And uh, it has enhanced the experience of people who go to and stay at the Bavarian or go there for dinner. Um, so this year was no different. It seems like every year. Now, to answer your specific question, the bill that we started with was a bill that largely was designed to correct some mistakes and defects in the bill we passed last year. Now, and I'm embarrassed to say that's you know that's always uh, that's always something that we have to deal with. It's it's one of the reasons, actually, that the legislature has to meet every year is to fix mistakes that it makes in legislation. And so we were we started with that, but as you know. Uh, once once you get legislation moving, uh, and particularly legislation in an area where lots of people have ideas and want to see changes, then the uh, the expression, Rob, in the legislative parlance is it becomes a Christmas tree. Oh, yeah, I've uh, heard that. <laughs> it, um, it often gets adorned with uh, lots of other uh, accoutrements and, and ornaments. Uh, by people who have ideas, and and so that's how that's really how this bill grew into what it was. It started out as a bill to correct some, uh, you know, mistakes in cross references and things like that, but um, it grew up to be much more. Do you think there's there's more to be done in the area of some of these liquor laws and and um, maybe Licensing. maybe with uh, legislation for. Yeah, I don't know. I've I've heard some talk about different people that saying that the Durham shop laws um, are antiquated in in West Virginia, and that we're paying higher insurance premiums um, to to have establishments uh, than our surrounding areas. So, is are, is there going to be any look into that and and how to fix those uh, particular areas? You know, I'm sure those things will get uh, consideration. And, uh, you know, I don't get out and about as much as I used to when I was younger and, and, and do, I don't do as much traveling as I once did, you know, to other places. But here's what seems to happen every year when, uh, that I've been in the Senate. You know, people say, hey, w Charlie, we were in Ohio, and here's what they do. Or we went, to, uh, we went down to a vineyard uh, near Charlottesville, and here's what they do. And uh, we found out that's not permitted in West Virginia. 
And so, you know, I'm not under uh, any illusion. I think every year that the legislature convenes, there will be people who are uh, pitching these ideas to modernize and, and uh, our, our alcohol laws and bring us, bring us into some conformity or competitive posture uh, with, with other states. Yeah, for one, we can fix that term non-intoxicating beer as the only kind of beer that can be sold. Yeah. Well, and it's it's a legal fiction. It's a great point, Rob, and that, you know, we're we're constrained in what we can do always by our constitution, our constitution limits, and our constitution says that um, there can be no uh, public sale of intoxicating liquors. So a couple legal fictions have developed over the last uh, century, really almost now, 75 years, out of that, that distilled spirits, alcohol, intoxicating liquors can be served only in private clubs. They're not allowed to be sold in public places. So, uh, you know, you guys, uh, Rob, you may remember when any place that, that you ever went to, restaurant or otherwise, that served uh, alcohol by the drink, distilled spirits, you generally had a buzzer. You had to yep. buzz. To some still have them. It. Yep. Yeah, some still do. Mm-hmm. And and under the consti- under the law, they could serve only to people who were quote unquote members, right? Now, uh, uh, beer uh, was defined by the legislature way before my time as non-intoxicating as an end run to that prescription. In other words, the legislature defined beer as a non-intoxicating beverage so that it wasn't limited to, uh, by the Constitution, uh, the Constitution's prohibition on public sale. I'm here to tell you, my college experience would indicate otherwise. <laughs> yeah, I, many of us have, if we could remember, if we uh, could remember. similar experience. Yeah. Ch- Charlie, do, are we, as a state, do we need to get out of the liquor business? I mean, uh, it, essentially, what the state is what who's selling this liquor to, to these establishments, and we're, we're kind of the middleman. Um, is, I know Virginia kind of does it the same way, but that just seems to me to be the wrong way to do it is there any inculation or i mean i don't know how much money we actually make from liquor um but it just seems it doesn't seem very capitalistic the way we do it well west virginia has always been a control state i'm old enough to remember where all the retail establishments were owned by the state you know if you wanted to buy a bottle of a distilled spirit the only place in west virginia you could buy it was at the state store and uh, now the legislature uh, did make some changes in that. That's probably been 40 or 50 years ago, maybe 40. That's before my time in the legislature where um, the, leg- the state, the ABC Commission, began to auction off every 10 years um, retail licenses. And I guess we, you know, the state just went through one of those three or four years ago, uh, where people buy the right for 10 years in a specific geographic area to be a, you know, liquor or distilled spirits retailer. And that's worked out well for the state. Uh, you know, the, there, there are advantages, I will say this, to being a control state. And, uh, you know, when you are an alcohol beverage control state, uh, you, if you don't overdo it, the the state the citizens do have control over who's doing what where and when and uh so you're not the first person that's mentioned maybe we ought to uh, surrender more control i'm certainly willing to talk about it uh but i do recognize there are advantages to being a state where the the state controls that distribution chain charlie I'd like to shift gears here a little bit and talk a little bit about the the um, the bill that uh, distributed some of the um, circuit court judges and the magistrate judges um, throughout the state to the different counties in different numbers. Can you talk a little bit about that and what? Uh, yeah, uh, what, what, I think it's a it's a great ahead. thing to talk about. Thank you for bringing it up. And we we spent a lot of time working on it in the Senate and the Senate Judiciary Committee and. 
in particular, uh, you know, uh, the Article 8 of our Constitution says that the year before you uh, elect judges uh, is the year when the legislature has the opportunity to look at judicial circuits, uh, switch them up, increase or decrease the number of judges in various places, uh, judges, circuit court judges, family court judges, and magistrates. And so this year, 2023, was our year because they're all up for election next year in 2024, circuit judges, family court judges, magistrates. And uh, we made some changes, uh, and they're important changes. Uh, you know, we uh, eight years ago, we, the change we made was we took everything to nonpartisan elections. And we, so that was, um, I thought, an important change. It was something for which I had advocated for many years, uh, albeit unsuccessfully. But we got the change made in 2015, and uh, that stays the same. We didn't change that. But as you guys all know and all your listeners know, uh, our pa- the growth in our panhandle has set us behind in some of these areas. So we're adding – we'll start with magistrates. We're adding two magistrates. We're adding one – we're adding uh, more than that overall in the state, but we're adding two in the eastern panhandle. We're adding a magistrate to Jefferson County to be elected in next year in 2024, and another in Berkeley County to be elected in 2024. Uh, and so one then, is, one is immediate, and, and then one more additional gets elected in 2024 to take position in 2025. Correct? Uh, no. Now we did we did uh, uh, provide for in the legislation the immediate addition of a magistrate in Montegallia County. Yeah. They're getting killed out there, and uh, so they're they're going to get two, but they're going to get one this July, and then there's one that will be elected uh, next year to begin service in January of 2025, and that's the that's the what we did with Berkeley and Jefferson County. Does so, this does this bring us in line with the workload that the rest of the state magistrates are doing, or, or are we always going to be behind, Charlie? Uh, well, this will get us closer, and okay. you know that's what that's one of the things we used to determine the allocation of the magistrates. We asked the state supreme court to commission studies on caseload and and uh, time. You know, not the number of cases that you have is one thing, but certain not all cases are equal. Some kinds of cases take way more time and work than others. And the Supreme Court, at our request, commissioned such a study for all the levels of the courts, circuit court, family court, and magistrate court. Uh, And we got that data at the beginning of the session. And and those data are what we used to, uh, you know, determine where we had to add uh, judicial officers, where we would uh, change them or take them away. We're adding the the family court judge circuit, that includes Berkeley and Jefferson County has right now three family court judges. We're adding one to that. And that is the only family court judge that got added in the whole state of West Virginia uh, in, this, in this year. And then when we go to circuit courts, we, um, we added, it's a net five, we, we added six and took one away. McDowell County has uh, two circuit court judges right now, and McDowell County is not much bigger than Morgan uh, these days, and so they don't need to. We actually consolidated and changed some judicial circuits. So we consolidated Wyoming and McDowell counties together. We consolidated Mingo and Logan. What we did in that bill in the Eastern Panhandle is we carved Jefferson off, and Jefferson County now will be its own judicial circuit. And it will have two judges. Um, so right now, the three eastern counties, Berkeley, Morgan, and Jefferson, form a single circuit that has six judges. So we're carving Jefferson off and adding a judge there. So it'll be a two-judge circuit. 
and there will be five judges in the other circuit, which will be Berkeley and Morgan County. Michael, now, Harmon, uh, you have a question there? Yeah, Charlie, I thought in the end there was an amendment that kept Berkeley, Jefferson, and Morgan together, but added that. I didn't I didn't realize that we'd carved Jefferson out. I thought that was amended late, but I may be wrong. You, you obviously know a lot more. Um, but I thought there was an amendment that kept our three counties together. It had gone back and forth, okay. but I think the final the final version of it is that Jefferson County is its own circuit. Okay. You know, we we looked at that eight years ago, and actually, uh, our, your uh, predecessor in the House, uh, Stephen Skinner, was an advocate for it. But when we looked at it eight years ago, it really didn't have the the caseload to support two full-time judges just in Jefferson County, but it does now, okay. and it's continuing to grow as all the eastern counties are, uh, Berkeley and, and Jefferson way more than Morgan, uh, so it seemed, to, it seemed to make sense to be able to do that, to create a circuit for Jefferson County. Charlie, how, how, right before we, okay, uh, so uh, real quick. How often do does the um, Supreme Court reallocate um, judges throughout the state? Well, it's not the Supreme Court. It's the legislature. That constitutional authority lies with the legislature under Article 8. Uh, so, and the Constitution's specific. It's every eight years in the year before judicial elections are held. So that's this year because all the elections, family courts, circuit courts, magistrates are all going to be elected in the elections next year family and circuit judges for eight-year terms magistrates for four-year terms so the answer is once every eight years that's the only time you can redraw the circuits now what you can do in between those eight-year intervals is add judges or magistrates and we've done that over the years we've had to uh, we've added judges to the uh, circuit court, to the magistrate court in Berkeley County in particular, in between those eight-year cycles because, you know, the growth has just been so so tremendous over here in this eastern panhandle. Charlie, you have time for one more? Do you have to run? No, I've got time. Okay. Uh, Jeff Haddix, who, who I know he does a lot of work with DHHR, a frequent uh, listener and commenter on our Facebook page, too, said, I'd hope Charlie would have gotten his DHHR worker bill passed, it would have lessened qualifications of certain workers to help with workforce issues. Yeah, yeah it, it did pass. Yeah. Uh, we got, we, at least we got, I got the provisions of it amended into a House bill, 3261, I think, was the House bill. And so um, what it says is that, uh, the, you know, they don't, they don't have to have necessarily... Um, social work degrees, bachelor's degrees, to start work at the DHHR as uh, CPS workers or youth services workers. Uh, the law, we, uh, it got it, we amended it into a House bill that, uh, it were, in which it seemed to fit, and it passed. So, uh, and I've got some good news on that. Now, I don't think this, I'm telling anything that's a secret, but one one of the things the bill says is that the DHHR can hire people with associate's degrees, two-year degrees from uh, an accredited college or university or community and technical college uh, or junior college uh, to, to do that youth ser services work. To start that, the DHHR has to train them up. And uh, there was some opposition to that, but um, we, we prevailed, and that's in the bill. It's... Um, and what, what I can tell you guys is just this week, just this week, Jeff Pack, you, your former colleague from the House of Delegates, who's the commissioner of um, you know, the Bureau of Social Services now, uh, was up here in the Eastern Panhandle to meet with not only the judges, but with Pete Chekovich at Blue Ridge Community and Technical College. And they're working on, I think they're, work, they're starting a conversation to work on a way that Pete could design an associate's program for people who are willing to do it, uh, who could be trained in to, to work. It could be our feedstock for the youth services workers, CPS workers at the DHHR, which we don't have now. We just don't have them. And the, the cases are, are languishing because the DHHR 
you know doesn't have the personnel. So we're you know we we had a multi front attack on this problem, a legislation to authorize pay increase, a legislation to authorize you know what you guys were uh, talking about before pay disparities, uh, regional pay uh, differentials. That's in this bill. Uh, it's permitted in this bill. The other thing that the bill says is that it allows the DHHR to hire uh, retired law enforcement officers, parole officers, uh, probation officers, uh, any of those retirees to do child protective services work. It makes perfect sense to me that those that you know I don't know whether they're going to become case managers. I don't think that'll be it, but they are the perfect people. Uh, to go out and knock on the doors when there are reports or referrals that children are being abused or neglected. You know, what a retired police officer, probation, or parole officer, can, if the DHHR could hire them to go out and knock on the doors, lay eyes upon a child to see if the child is in imminent danger, uh, and, uh, you know, fill those voids that we have here in in, in that in that workforce right now. We've had, you know, the DHHR has just had a terrible time getting people and keeping people. And um, I'm really hoping that we, some of the legislation we pass this year is going to move the ball forward on that. Jeff, I hope that answers your question. And, Charlie, thank you for the explanation on that. Good stuff. I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you, Charlie. Great talking to you guys. Have a great weekend. You, you too. too.